And it was a game that, you know what, you could see them losing. It was a game that they had many opportunities to kick it away. It was a game that, hey, they were really helped by the officials. They really were. <laughs> let's be honest. Let's let's not completely be homers and say, oh, those were good calls. Those were bad calls. Now, you've heard it dissected throughout the day, so we don't have to go piece by piece. But the bottom line is the Knicks caught a break. They took advantage of those breaks. The Indiana Pacers did not. And every other uh, series that the Knicks and the Pacers have played in their history together, the winner of the first game wins the series. So do with that what you may. But another brilliant performance by Brunson, a brilliant performance by Di Vincenzo, another complete game for Josh Hart. Kind of amazing what's happening. This this team has a feeling that there's some magic pixie dust on them. Now that runs counter to the fact that they're hard workers and they play the game the right way, but they do get the breaks. And things that have to go right do go right. So they're at one game to nothing, and congratulations. Well, it seems like the better you are, the more breaks you get because you take advantage of them, and they become glaring. Uh, Nobody talks about it unless you go out there and take advantage of those breaks. Now, we're eagerly anticipating the two-minute report, which we kind of laughed at a couple of weeks ago, and now it's become almost like a daily thing. Where we wait for it. And I'm mean, actually hearing players in post-game press conferences talk about, yeah, well, we're going to wait for the two-minute report. Like, I think that there's almost scouting that goes in now by players and coaches. Okay, what are they calling? What is the NBA apologizing for? You know, How can we work that to our advantage? So I don't know if this was the end game by the NBA, because that's always the question, why do they do it? Because they can't go back and change it. But, Michael, if it's being scouted and talked about by the players and coaches, I guess there is value to it, and I'm really eagerly anticipating what they're going to actually take a stand on and not take a stand on when it comes out today. You know what I come away thinking about today? Not only the the refing was just, I mean, it was brutal. Too involved. The kickball, first of all, that's just, if you're a Pacers fan, how are you not just so red hot over that? What a monster possession that is. And then, of course, they can't review the kickball. We see the replay. It's clear it was off someone's hand and, and not a foot. So you have that one. You have the, the, the very unnecessary uh, screen call late, which, of course, held up because it was technically a foul. But just the spot to call it, uh, given the level of the foul, was very odd. But that's not what I come away thinking today. What? You know, what do you come away thinking? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I have a question to pose to the audience. Hmm. Jalen Brunson is the greatest Nick since blank. I mean, we're starting to get to a territory, guys. I don't want to go crazy, but there has not been a lot of playoff greatness on this team in a long time. So it is reasonable. I I know he needs to prove it over years. But it is reasonable, Don and Michael, to to believe he's absolutely going to surpass Carmelo Anthony. And you're talking about then how far back are we going? Is he the greatest Nick since Patrick Ewing? I mean, that's the sort of air I think he's getting into night by night. It's insane what he did last night again, again, guys. 14 to 26, well, the, breaks 40 I, again. I, I think it's unfair, right, Michael, to start you know judging him against Hall of Famers. Because he he's too young, he hasn't been here long enough. But I don't know if any Nick has ever gone any kind of kind of a run like this. I mean, you can make the case as anybody in sports in New York ever had a run of games the way he's had a run of games here in the postseason. But there's been seven games, and what I and, and at least five of them he has been a complete beast. Who else, Michael? Yankee, Met, Ranger, Nick. Net and Devil. I mean, has anybody been this good for this long a stretch of playoff time? Well, I mean, I have an answer, but I know I don't want to be saddled with the Yankee boy. There's one guy that I could think of, and that was A. Rod in 2009. But he didn't even win the MVP of that World Series. Uh, no, Isn't that I get it. Crazy, but the, first, the first rounds of the playoffs, he was he was a beast. Uh, I I I do. and he was really good in the World Series. But Matsui had an even better World but Series. This is almost like. Because how many times has he gone north of 40 in the seven games they played? Five. Five. Five four, times. Four, four. I think 139 and, but, but, and but, four but he, over 40. But he's been a beast in five, if not six of the seven games. Like, he has had an absolute pre- – this would almost be like a, in baseball, like going three for four of the home run like four or five times in a seven-game span. Like, it's that level. A-Rod batted – in 2009, A-Rod, A-Rod over the course of the playoffs batted 365 – had 19 hits, six home runs, 
18 RBIs and 15 runs scored. That's, that was his, that was an unbelievable stretch. That's a, Again, that's a hell of a stretch. said he didn't win the MVP in the World Series, but the, the other two rounds, it was unbelievable what he did. I don't know if they separate it like that, Peter, but, but that's the still, other two rounds are unbelievable. Well, that's still an unbelievable Yeah, but, 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 but we're but even if it out there. But, okay, so even if that, if you're saying the best run we've seen in New York sports was Alex Rodriguez, one of the greatest natural baseball players of all time, 15 years ago, uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable to think about what Jalen Brunson's doing right now. You know, John Winthrop, our pinhead suit, comes up with another one, too, the week that Daniel Murphy had. Yeah, Mets. that was incredible too. Yeah, well, this is this is an amazing because you know Alex Rodriguez is kind of like he's supposed to be a great baseball player. Um, Daniel Murphy, I can't speak to. This guy is an undersized player who is controlling the game of giants. You don't see that very often. He is a transcendent talent out of nowhere. No one could tell me that the Knicks thought that this is the player they were getting. They thought they were getting a nice point guard. They didn't get. They didn't think they were getting a superstar. This guy is a out and out superstar, and the ridiculousness, the, the silliness that ESPN put out it's yesterday embarrassing. that he's the fifteenth most valuable player in the first round of the playoffs. You got to well, stop. They should have just Don said it best. You're just getting lost in a miasma of numbers. Just look at your eye. What do your eyes say? No, and once and once they saw that it came out that way, they should have said, "Oh, this metric's bad." Yeah, we shouldn't use this metric now, Michael. You asked specifically for the series <laughs> in 2009. Uh, Alex Rodriguez in the first round against the Angels was nine of 21 with two doubles and three home runs. Then they went on to play. Oh, sorry, sorry, that was the second round. I apologize. Started with Minnesota, five of 11. Two home runs. The next round against the Angels, nine of twenty-one, two doubles, three home runs, and then no, he, the, was all, he was all the worldly. And then in the World Series, still good, but five right. of twenty with one home run. So yeah, yeah that that's pretty good. So he had the, the he must have won the um, the the he MVP won the for, ALCS the, for the ALCS. MVP. There, was, there was not the first round doesn't have an MVP. And right. if he had an MVP for the entire postseason, he probably which wins. I think, which I wish they would, because I, I think it's all attacked. You think so? Right? You think batting four fifty five six RBIs in the in, right. in the last game? How long was the Daniel Murphy stretch in fifteen? Though what was it? It was like five games. It was the six whole games, right? no, it was the whole like the whole playoffs. He was incredible. I got to get yeah. his numbers, but he, he, the World Series he was not right. He came back to earth. Off. No one was great in the World Series, but then, it, was, it was pretty insane. Now there's up. a don't want to take. I do not. I don't want to get in arguments about this. I don't want to take the shine off the Knicks' victory. It's a win. They won the first game of the playoffs. They're in good shape. But there's, there's a couple of things that concern me. Number one, and maybe this is the way it's going to be, Halliburton had six points. He was shut down completely by DiVincenzo. Great defensive effort. People look at DiVincenzo and think, oh, he's a shooter. He's a sniper. He's a great defender. And he has proven that. He proved that against Maxi in Game 6, and he shut down Halliburton yesterday. So the Pacers had a legitimate chance to win with Halliburton scoring 6. The other thing that really is a concern as we move along, these guys are playing incredible minutes. So in the, in the seven games they've played so far, the minutes accumulated by Josh Hart, it's the most minutes by one player in the first seven games of playoff since LeBron James. But that was when LeBron James was 21. I, I don't know how Josh Hart's doing it. So the thing that scares me, I know teams shorten their rotation in the postseason. I get it. Tibbs said it. I agree with it. But at some point, these guys are not superhuman. It's got to affect them, I would think. I, I'm, I'm, I'm praying to the basketball gods that it doesn't. But the bench on the Pacers... Outscored the Knicks by like eight to one. No, no, not even more than that. They destroyed the Knicks. The Knicks had three points off the bench. How long could that keep going? Those are the two things that worry me. Well, the the first thing you said about um, concerns and Halliburton, yeah, absolutely, is that I think for both the Garden teams, the opposition, the Pacers and the Hurricanes, can feel in a loss. 
pretty good about where they stand. Right, not terrible. They don't feel terrible. Pacers have to feel like maybe we'll get the calls in game two. If we play the same game, we've got an excellent chance to get the split, which is all they're looking for. Same with the Hurricanes. So I think the Pacers and the Hurricanes feel good that they can hang. They, they feel bad they lost. But I think they did enough to believe they can win game two, get home, make it a best of five. And I've heard this debated over and over again the entire playoffs. Are the Knicks conditioned, because this is the way they play all year, to have it not affect them? Or because they play this way all year, at some point will it affect them? I kind of lean towards the latter. I think at some point... Trusting on a five, six man rotation, sometimes seven. They did have eight yesterday, but let's face it, the guys off the bench didn't score and hardly played. At some point, Michael, it's going to catch up with you. You're going to get by the Pacers, I believe, but it's going to be really difficult against a team like the Celtics to think that this is the way to be able to get through. It's it's got to catch up with you. It just has to. I, I just think that the 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 bad feeling I'd have if if I'm a Nick fan is are we just do we just sign up for another series sort of like the last one where we can win but it's going to be grueling and it's going to require Jalen Brunson being the best player on earth for us to win cuz that's what yesterday was in a game in which Halliburton did nothing and in which the refs basically said I mean it was basically like Danny Davis or Earl Hebner it was it was old school wrestling cheating referee energy I mean they really the refs said hey Knicks we want you to win it took that and Brunson, by the way, and DiVincenzo having huge moments. All of that came together for a narrow victory in game one. So does that scare you that this, I, I don't think you leave as the Pacers feeling terrible about yesterday. And I'm going to prepare for the phone calls. I haven't even glanced at the guys that are on hold yet and gals. Nobody is saying it wasn't a screen. Like it, It's a foul. They reviewed it. What happened to DiVincenzo was a foul. But everyone to a mind, even Alan Hahn, when I was driving in, said, you never see that called at the end of a game, ever. Well, no, that's not true. We saw it in in, in, in women's college basketball. They called on, that was on not the same that, thing. That got a team to the final. I thought that was. I thought that was a much more egregious play. To me, that one stood out. Like when they showed the replay, I went, "Oh well, yeah, you got to call the, that." The woman that was fouled on that play, I thought legitimately fell. DiVincenzo did sell it. Oh yeah, it was a flopperoo. I'm not mad at it. No, but but, 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 but even Van Gundy said, like, you never see that call. Here's, now, now it was called earlier on DiVincenzo. You wonder if it was a makeup call. Not at that point. I mean, that, that's they're, they're, the Knicks are up by one at that point. No. Yeah. And if Halliburton scores or anybody scores, obviously the, the Pacers might win the game. Now, Tim Legler was on Get Up this morning, and he said he disagrees with the illegal screen call. That illegal screen call? That's going out of your way to inject yourself Thank into you. a situation where you don't need. Here's why, here's why it's such a big deal to me. There's not a single person in that building, including Tom Thibodeau and that entire coaching staff and every player in the Knicks who's going to have a problem with that not being called. Correct. That's where I have such a problem with as a player, you know. Dante DiVincenzo, give him credit, man. You took a big chance That's a flop. selling out on that and flopping to that extent because if they don't call that, you're playing 5 on 4 for a second with Miles Turner slipping to the rim, mm -hmm. and you could be compromised where you give up a wide open shot. So he took a huge risk. Now, here's, Brian, here's Brian Windhorst on GetUp. He said that wasn't the biggest play, though. I know what he's going to say. I know exactly where he's going. I do, too. I think we're looking at the wrong call. The, the kickball is the bigger call, and I'm going to tell oh. you why. Mm, because wrong. it's a turnover but for the huge. Pacers. It's a tie game. Mm -hmm. It's a five-point penalty. Jalen Brunson throws a terrible pass here. Look at the Pacers. They're going on a fast break. Mm -hmm. It's going to be three on one. They're going to finish that with either a foul or a basket. Instead, it leads to a three-pointer. Five-point play. They admit after the game they got it wrong. Zach Zarba, one of the best officials in the NBA, comes out in the media after the game. We got that call wrong. When the two-minute report comes out today, they're going to say that Miles Turner play was was an illegal screen. That that call is going to hold up. I you guys are right that you can't, you shouldn't call it there. That call is going to hold up. The kick ball can't hold up. Not reviewable. Uh, he, it's a great point. And then I would say, you know what? The screen may be third because the foul being called prior to the inbounds, which gets you the T yeah, and the free throw of the I ball, that ends the game. So yeah. I, there were there were three different calls that were bad. All went in favor of the Knicks. Now, there's one I have a pet peeve about the challenge system. So Tibbs challenged 
his first challenge, I believe, in the third. Got it right. So he retains his challenge. Challenged another one in the fourth. Got it right. That's it. No more challenges. Well, well, why? Why not? You, you keep getting challenges till right. you get it wrong. If the officials could keep making wrong calls, why is Tibbs not allowed to have another challenge? Why is it capped at two? Now, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong in the NFL, if that in that scenario, you'll get another challenge. If you get two right. Right. Well, there's one challenge in an NBA game. Right. So if you get that one right, you get a second. If you challenge with the second and you get that right, you don't have any more. It doesn't right. make sense. Well, because, you know, the, the thing with replay, it, it happens in all sports, is the, the, the famous Michael K. line, you're half pregnant. Because they, don't, they want to put a governor on it. Because they don't want everything to be challenged. Because then we're going to be here all night. But if you're going to have replay and you're going to have officials make mistakes and games are going to be big, you don't want to have to run out of a chance to challenge. You want to be able to get it right. But they're so afraid there'll be 20 challenges during a game, so they want to put a governor on it so it doesn't get crazy. But in that type of a moment, Michael, you should not. You shouldn't be caught with a situation where an egregious play happens and you can't challenge it because you ran out of challenges, not because you're overly aggressive with your challenges, but because the officials get it wrong too much. It's, it's mind-boggling. It, it, it makes no sense. So you can correct two bad calls, and then the officials could then be completely inept for the rest of the game, and you can't challenge it on it. And also, I don't understand why the kickball is not challengeable. It's ridiculous. You can see it on a replay. You could see that on a replay. Amazing. But, uh, listen, and, and it's going to happen, but, but but here's what you don't want to have happen, and you got to hold your breath because it's probably going to, is now they're not going to get the calls in game two, and now, now they're going to have to go over just not just the Pacers but the officials. Just get the calls right. But now because they at least perceived to get some breaks down the stretch, Michael, how do you think it's going to go tomorrow? Well, look at how it went after the Knicks exactly. got that call. Yeah. Exactly. You went in favor of the Sixers, and they took yep. advantage of it. The only difference here now is that you don't – now Now you're going to be going uh, in a 1-1 tie going to Indiana with a, a best-of-five series with them having home court. So uh, you, you hope that that's not the case. Just get the calls right. But why do you have a feeling like that if there's anything up for grabs, it's going to go the Pacers' way? And, and I don't want anybody to think like Adam Silver makes a call to somebody who makes a call to somebody with the officials. No. The officials know they blew it. They read the two-minute report, mm-hmm. and then subconsciously, they're going to favor the Pacers. They don't have to be told that. So there's no conspiracy. They know they screwed up, mm-hmm. and now they're going to try to unscrew it up. It's just human nature. It, 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 you're right. It's not a call. It, because believe me, if, if there's conspiracy theories, there is nobody in the NBA offices that want the Pacers to win over the Knicks. All right? They, they're going right. to want the New York market to be so. There's not conspiracy theories. just bad officiating. But you're right, it is just human nature now. If something is up for grabs tomorrow, don't be shocked if it ends up going the Pacers' way. All right, so we've got to uh, start this off. It's a tradition, unlike any other. Um